Coming up on this Thursday edition of Daybreak, a bill calling for the body of water between Korea and Japan to be referred to as the Korean name East Sea as well as Sea of Japan in Virginia textbooks passes the House of Delegates. The governor's signature is all that stands between it becoming law. Addressing the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, Korea's foreign minister demands Japan admit to its sexual enslavement of Korean women during the Second World War and make efforts for an early resolution of the issue. First, the foreign ministers of Russia and key Western powers hold talks in Paris to try to resolve the crisis in Ukraine. The European Union also offers 15 billion US dollars in aid to Kiev. Daybreak begins now. Thanks for joining us. To all our viewers here in Korea and around the world, it's 6am on Thursday, March 6th here in Seoul. You're watching Daybreak and I'm Mark Broom. And we start with another step forward in the push for the co-designation of the name East Sea as well as Sea of Japan in school textbooks in the U.S. state of Virginia. On Wednesday, the so-called East Sea Bill, a bill that obligates the dual naming of the body of water, passed the Virginia House of Delegates in an 82 to 16 vote and now only requires Governor Terry McAuliffe's signature for it to become law. McAuliffe is expected to sign the bill by early April at the latest and the bill will take effect from July 1st. The bill is a major victory for the state's substantial Korean-American community, which has been pushing hard for the change. They, as well as all Koreans, view the Sea of Japan designation as an unpleasant reminder of Japan's brutal colonization of the Korean Peninsula in the early to mid-20th century. Korean Foreign Minister Yoon byung se has demanded Tokyo admit to its sexual enslavement of Korean women during the Second World War and make efforts for an early resolution of the issue. Speaking at a UN session in Geneva Wednesday, Korea's top diplomat also condemned Japanese officials and politicians for attempting to whitewash the country's past wrongdoings. Hwang Sang-hee reports. Speaking before the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva on Wednesday, South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon byung se urged Japan to take responsibility and compensate the victims of its wartime sexual slavery. Calling for an end in sexual violence and armed conflicts, he noted violations that took place in the past in which the perpetrators have yet to repent, pointing to the so-called comfort women as a living evidence. This is an added insult to the honor and dignity of those victims who had weathered physical and psychological pains in their lifelong haunted memories. Such an attitude is an affront to humanity and disregards the historical truth. An estimated 200,000 women, mostly Korean, were used as sex slaves by the Japanese army in the early 20th century. This marks the first time since 2006 that a top diplomat from Korea is attending the UN Human Rights Council session, and the first time ever the comfort women issue was raised, a sign that Seoul is serious about tackling the matter. The starting point of the prevention of human rights violations is for countries to admit past wrongdoings, take responsibility for such deeds, and educate the correct history to the future generations. Referring to comments recently made by Japanese Vice Education Minister, who claimed the Japanese military's use of sex slaves is a fabricated story, Minister Yun stressed the importance of educating correct history. Minister Yun also touched upon a recent UN report on North Korea's human rights violations and expressed hopes it will lead to practical steps for improving human rights conditions in the regime. Top diplomats from around 50 nations attended the UN Human Rights Council session, but Japanese Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida was not present. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Moving now to Seoul's push to establish regular reunions for families separated since the Korean War. South Korea has written to the North asking for talks over the urgent humanitarian issue, but as our Kim Jong reports, many expect Pyongyang to turn the offer down. 
Seoul's Unification Ministry sent a written proposal to Pyongyang on Wednesday, suggesting that the two Koreas hold talks on making reunions for families separated by the Korean War a regular event. Deputy spokesperson Park Soo-jin said the ministry proposed holding a round of working-level Red Cross talks next Wednesday on the South Korean side of Panmunjom, which is located on the de facto border between the two Koreas. The offer follows President Park Geun-hye's call for regular family reunions during a speech on March 1st, where she pointed out that tens of thousands of South Koreans remain on a waiting list to see their long-lost loved ones in the North. The last round of reunions two weeks ago were the first in more than three years. Pyongyang has yet to respond to Seoul's proposal. Local media outlets in Seoul say Pyongyang is likely to reject the offer and instead make a counterproposal for working-level talks where other unresolved cross-border issues could be discussed, such as a resumption of tours to the North Mount Kungam Resort and the lifting of economic sanctions on North Korea. Experts say Pyongyang is likely to respond to Seoul's proposal after a joint military exercises between Seoul and Washington and on Thursday. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. South Korea is engaged in a delicate balancing act at the moment. On one hand, Seoul wants to maintain amicable ties for the sake of family reunions, but it's also having to react to a series of small-scale provocations in recent days. Seoul's defense ministry says Pyongyang violated UN resolutions with its missile launches this week and could have accidentally shot down a commercial airliner. Kim Hyun bin reports. South Korea's defense ministry said Wednesday that the previous day's rocket launches were a violation of UN Security Council resolutions, as the North did not notify anyone of the event in advance, and the missiles jeopardized a commercial Chinese airliner flying through North Korean airspace. This is a violation of UN Security Council resolutions, and it has threatened the safety of a commercial airliner. Pyongyang should stop its provocations and abide by international standards. Defense Ministry spokesperson Kim Min Sok labeled the launches as explicit acts of aggression against a series of ongoing military exercises by South Korea and the U.S., adding that Seoul is keeping a close watch on the possibility of additional provocations to come. The missiles were short range KN 02 ballistic missiles, and military sources in South Korea said Wednesday the North has around 100 of the missiles in its arsenal. The missiles can load up to 400 kilograms of explosives and chemical weapons and dozens of missiles can be launched in minutes. The KN-02 has a maximum range of 170 kilometers and can hit a target at that distance in less than four minutes, posing a huge threat to the Seoul metropolitan area. It is thought that 30 KN-02 missiles are mounted on mobile launch pads and have Seoul in their crosshairs. North Korea has recently developed a multiple rocket launcher called the KN-09, which is presumed to have a target distance of 200 kilometers. That means that missiles shot from the border could reach Kirongde, where the joint military bases of South Korea's Army, Air Force and Navy headquarters are located. The Pentagon said Tuesday in its latest strategy document that North Korea poses a growing threat to the United States because of its pursuit of long-range missiles and nuclear weapons development. The U.S. Defense Department said the U.S. military will keep up its investment in missile defense while maintaining a major presence in the region. Kim Hyun-bin. Arirang News. And North Korea is justifying its recent series of missile and rocket launches as defensive in nature. A statement released by the North Korean People's Army on Wednesday said the missile and rocket tests that started last week were conducted to protect the nation's airspace and territory. It added the ongoing joint South Korea-U.S. military drills are provocative and that Pyongyang would fire off its strongest rocket if it feels threatened. North Korea has fired off a number of Scud missiles and short-range projectiles using multiple rocket launches over the past week and a half. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. The Korean government has unveiled its to-do list for its ambitious three-year economic innovation plan. Some 60 tasks 
focus on balancing domestic demand and exports, boosting the R&D sector and reforming public organisations. Huang Jie has the details. A total of 59 detailed tasks will back up the Korean government's three-year economic innovation plan. Finance Minister Hyun Suk said during an economy-related minister's meeting on Wednesday that they focus on removing excessive red tape in the name of growth and bolstering sluggish corporate investment. To accomplish the latter and boost venture businesses, the government first plans to offer bigger tax breaks for so-called angel investors, those who invest in startups. For example, angel investors would not be taxed for investments of up to 15 million won, or roughly 14,000 U.S. dollars, starting next year through 2017. The government also plans to provide financial support worth $880 million for 500 small and medium-sized businesses every year starting in 2015. Hyun said that the government is drawing up a package of measures aimed at easing regulations that hamper active participation of private equity funds in the mergers and acquisition market. The government will go through the tasks in an economy-related minister's meeting that takes place every week. It would also set up a separate task force team to monitor how well the tasks are being achieved. Huang Jie, Arirang News. Korea's household savings grew at their slowest pace in six years in 2013. The Bank of Korea said Wednesday that the amount of household deposit at banks came to roughly 470 billion U.S. dollars at the end of last year, up 6.6 percent from the previous year. Of that, the amount of savings deposits stood at around $430 billion. That's up 5.5% from a year earlier, the slowest pace in six years. Demand deposits, which can be withdrawn at any time, grew at their fastest pace in 12 years, jumping 20% in the same period to roughly $40 billion. Household credit came to $955 billion at the end of last year, up 6% from 2012. Over now to the latest shake-up in Korea's parliament. The chief of opposition Democratic Party Kim Han-gil and An Chol Su of the new political vision party will serve as co-leaders of their new coalition party. Making the announcement at the National Assembly briefing on Wednesday, a spokesperson said an equal number of lawmakers from each side would serve as the party's leadership, although the size of it uh, has yet to be determined. Kim and An will make a final decision on how the new coalition will be launched as soon as today, Thursday, the surprise merger between the DP and uh, the new political vision party came on March 1st. President Park Geun-hye has appointed four-term lawmaker Lee Ju Young as the new Minister of Oceans and Fisheries. The presidential office of Chung Wade says President Park approved a parliamentary committee's hearings report on Wednesday which makes E's appointment official. Former fisheries minister Yoon Jin Suk was dismissed early last month over inappropriate remarks and actions concerning an oil leak off Korea's south coast. And turning now to the latest on the crisis in Ukraine, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says Russia's violation of Ukraine's integrity has united the world in support of the Ukrainian people. Speaking in Paris just a few moments ago, following face-to-face -face talks with his Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov, Kerry said there were a number of ideas on the table to resolve the tensions, but stressed Ukraine's territorial integrity must be respected. Lavrov said Moscow and Western powers agreed the Ukrainian government and opposition need to respect a UN-brokered peace deal, which was signed late last month. Meanwhile, the European Union has unveiled a package of aid and grants to Ukraine's new government worth some 15 billion U.S. dollars over the next couple of years. Good day, I'm Eunice Kim, and here are your headlines from around the world. China opened its annual National People's Congress on Wednesday, and at the start of the 10-day meeting, the military budget was given a boost, and the economic growth target was held steady. Shin Semin reports. 
China has unveiled its master plan for the year, and it includes a bigger military budget and a stable economic growth target. The figures were announced on Wednesday, the first day of an annual legislative session of the National People's Congress. Beijing will boost its military defense budget by 12.2 percent to about 131 billion U.S. dollars. That percentage is greater than that of total government expenditure, which will rise 9.5 percent this year. The fatter defense budget comes as Chinese President Xi Jinping seeks to create a stronger military amid heightened tensions in the East Asian region. Xi is making a statement by raising the defense budget that he wants to make China a maritime power while strengthening border and air defenses. It follows Beijing's declaration in November of an air defense identification zone over the East China Sea that enraged neighboring countries. With regard to economic growth, last year's target of 7.5 percent was retained. The world's second largest economy grew 7.7 percent last year, its worst rate of growth since 1999. The 7.5 percent target for this year might make it difficult to achieve Beijing's goals of curbing credit risks and solving the nation's pollution problem. But Premier Li Kung-chung said smog would be a priority, describing the issue as a red-light warning against inefficiency. The full session of the Congress will run for a total of nine days, during which corruption, pollution and regional issues will be addressed. Xin Zemin, Arirang News. And we turn to the Red Sea next, where a ship carrying dozens of advanced Syrian-produced rockets was stopped by the Israeli Navy. Israel said the M302 rockets were sent by Iran and ultimately bound for Palestinian guerrillas in the Gaza Strip and could be used to strike deep into Israel. Hamas has dismissed the accusations, and the seizure does come as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is in the United States pushing for tougher international action against Iran. And crossing over to Egypt now, a trial of journalists accused of aiding terrorists has resumed. In all, 20 people stand accused of supporting the Muslim Brotherhood, which was labeled a terrorist group in December of last year. The trial is being closely watched as a barometer of Cairo's posture toward freedom of the press. Among the group's standing trial include nine Al Jazeera journalists and a former BBC correspondent. Defendant Mohammed Fadel Fahmy, Al Jazeera's Canadian Egyptian bureau chief shouted, journalists are not terrorists before the hearing began. And over in India, the country's election commission has confirmed parliamentary elections will begin on April 7th and will conclude on May 15th with the vote count. The poll to elect a new lower house of Lok Sabha has attracted the largest number of registered voters of 814 million people, a world record. The elections will pit the ruling Congress party against the main opposition Bharatiya Janata Party. If a clear majority is not reached, minor parties could play a larger role in legislative affairs. And on to a different kind of poll, a survey conducted by a French daily, which was never published but leaked, found that more than half, 56 percent of the French polled, chose former IMF director Dominique Strauss-Kahn as the better choice to incumbent Francois Hollande to lead the country. The survey was polled by Les Parisiens, reportedly due to editorial reasons. Strauss-Kahn was widely anticipated to run in the 2012 presidential election against incumbent Nicolas Sarkozy, but a 2011 arrest for sexually assaulting a hotel maid in the U.S. forced him to resign from the IMF. The case was settled, but he currently faces other legal battles in France for aggravated pimping.
And a good Thursday morning to you all as we kick things off with the much anticipated friendly between Korea and Greece. And with South Korea's Park Ji Young in the spotlight, he pulled through for the Taeguk Warriors. Now, in what many considered at his last chance to make the World Cup squad, Park Ji Young scores a brilliant goal in the 17th minute of the match as he puts Korea up 1 0. Greece, meanwhile, had several chances to score, but hits the goalpost on several occasions. As sensational's holding Min finds the back of the net in the 54th minute, giving Korea the 2-0 lead. A well-played match from the Taeguk Warriors as they beat the 12th-ranked Greece 2-0. And moving on, the Sochi Olympians continue to get their heroes welcome as they were invited by President Park Geun-hye on Wednesday for lunch. With 99 athletes and a total of 170 members being invited by President Park Geun-hye for lunch, President Park Geun-hye had a chance to speak with some of the athletes and shared her feelings about the recent Winter Games. Now, she stated that the nation is no longer obsessed with gold medals and still embraces the athletes despite not finishing first in their events. Now, President Park added that Olympians are the true heroes and thanked them for putting in their best. And moving over to curling, where the Korean curling team continues to impress as this time, the junior team finished with a silver medal in the Junior World Championships. Now, after advancing to the finals after beating Sweden the day before, they go on to face off against Canada and fall short, losing 6-4. to four. And with the silver medal finish, it's the best finish by any Korean curling team at an international competition as Korea continues to shine in the sport. And now moving over to some Wednesday night's KBL action, we had the Busan KT Sonic Boom beat Won Ju Dong Bu Promi 80 to 74. Meanwhile, it was a battle between these two Seoul teams as Seoul SK Knights took on the Seoul Samsung Thunder. So let's take a look at the highlights. Now a close game from the start as Samsung takes a slim 13 to 12 lead after the first quarter before running away with it in the second quarter as they take a 37-28 lead going into halftime. But SK comes storming back in the third quarter of the game, outscoring them 25-19. But with Samsung's Iguan He putting up 17 points in the game, Samsung holds on to take this game 73 to 69. And now finishing things off with some V-League action this time, Hyundai Hill State pulls off a 3-0 win over the struggling Hungook Insurance Life Pink Spiders over on the Women's League. Meanwhile, with the Korean Air Jumbos taking on Kepko Vicstorms, let's take a look at the highlights. Now going into the game here, first set Michael Sanchez and Shin Young Su combined for 16 points as they help the Jumbos take the first set 25-21. Kepko makes it interesting in the next two sets, but fails to win a single set as the Jumbos take this game three sets to nothing thanks to Michael Sanchez and his 29 points on the night. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Well, it's cold, and yes, we are having a bitterly cold start to the day. Uh, most regions are waking up to quite cold this morning on the minus side, and afternoon highs will be also slightly cooler today. And the cold wave advisory was issued in the mountainous areas in Gangwon-do, and dry weather watch was issued in most parts of the country, including here in Seoul. So be cautious when handling fires and stay hydrated by drinking plenty of water. But other than that, the whole country will enjoy mostly to partly sunny skies today. But snow in the east from yesterday has turned to snowy and icy patches on the roads, which could or will cause headaches for morning commuters. So if you're in Gyeongsangbuk-do or Gangwon-do, please drive with extra caution today. Now, temperature-wise, though, the weather is expected to get warmer, uh, recovering to normal by Saturday. So till then, let's stay warm. Uh, with that in mind, here are the 
your readings for today. But morning low in Seoul starts out at minus four, and afternoon highs will only rise to five, while Daegu and Gwangju should get up to eight, and Busan will top out at nine in the afternoon. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju and Daejeon will climb up to eight and seven respectively, while the top temperature on Mount Kungang will be at minus one. Well, that's all for me at this hour, and back to you, Mark, in the studio. Well, thank you very much, Gian, for the weather there. And those are the stories we're following at this hour. Stay tuned. Korea Today is coming up in half an hour's time. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.